happy Saturday. 165 years ago today, Cruz finished laying the first transatlantic telegraph cable, and then the first successful communication was sent along that cable a few days later. So we are replaying our episode on the first transatlantic cable today. This originally came out on November 9th, 2016. Enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today we are listening to uh, a topic that we have gotten a number of requests for. One of them uh, that sticks in my mind was a request from our listener, Jeff. But basically, the 1830s and the 1840s were a really exciting time for communication. Throughout the world, scientists and inventors were experimenting with uh, telegraphy in some form or another. And the world sort of stood on this threshold of information flow. And once the ability to reach one another through mechanical means started to become a reality, of course, as we know, living in the digital age now, that information flow quickly became a full-on jet. But it really was like a pretty speedy transition even then. Uh, But to get to that initial point where things really started to be global, it took almost two decades to get a message sent across the Atlantic Ocean by telegraph. That's from the time the idea was adopted as the next logical step for global communication to when they actually got a line completed and working. And this is sort of a story of inspiration and daring. But above all, the real story here is tenacity, as you will see. Our story of the transatlantic cable, unsurprisingly, we'll start with Samuel Morse, who is credited with the invention of the telegraph. And his original career trajectory, if you're not familiar with it, might surprise you a little bit. I yeah. certainly was. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Samuel F.B. Morse was born on April 27th of 1791 to parents Jedediah and Elizabeth Finley Morse. And as a student, both at Phillips Academy and then at Yale College, his performance was pretty middling in all subjects except for art, which he loved. I mean, he was not really aspiring to be an engineer or an inventor at this point. He wanted to become a painter when he got out of college. That was not a particularly lucrative career plan. After an apprenticeship to a Boston publisher, it was apparent that art really was the only thing that he was interested in. So his father sent him to England to study at the Royal Academy, where he developed his style in the Romantic tradition. Uh, So after studying in England, he returned to Boston in 1815, and he set up a studio there where he continued to paint these large epic pieces that were really well regarded, but they weren't very lucrative. Everybody loved to look at them and talked about how good they were, but nobody was buying them. So a few years into his art career, he married a woman named Lucretia Walker. This was in 1818. And at this point, he realized he had to make ends meet and provide for his bride, and they were having a family. So he began taking commissions to paint portraits, often traveling to do so. Seven years into the marriage, Lucretia died after giving birth to the couple's third child. And Samuel was away on a painting job when this happened. He was so devastated that he wasn't able to make it home in time for her burial, and this was just the beginning of a series of heartaches for him. His father died the following year, and then his mother passed away a few years after that. So eventually, Morse decided to travel to Europe in 1829 for a three-year trip that was intended to help him move through his grief. Uh, This also proved to be a pivotal move because on the return voyage, once he had had done this traveling, he met physician and sometimes inventor and a great potential podcast subject, Charles Thomas Jackson. So according to the story, uh, Jackson and Morse discussed the possibilities of the transmission of messages via electrical current. And Morse came away from this discussion very inspired. After making some quick initial sketches for a machine and then spending several years studying the electric relay work of scientist Joseph Henry, Morse started building a telegraph prototype. Uh, As has been the case with many inventions we've talked about in the podcast, Morse's telegraph did not just appear in a vacuum. Not only was he building on the work of others, but there are also numerous other inventors who were working on similar concepts at the time, with all of them basically driven by a goal of improved communication for humankind. Yeah, it's important to remember that if you wanted to communicate something across the Atlantic Ocean, which was a frequent uh, 
destination, like people in the States were often sending things back to Europe and vice versa, the fastest you could expect a letter to reach someone was like a week. And that was a really fast instance. I'm thinking about all the various things we've talked about over the past years of the show where problems would have been completely prevented if it didn't take weeks for a letter to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So this was sort of on a lot of people's minds. They were like, man, if only I could get communication to go faster. So that's why many people were working on this. And so uh, from 1838 to 1842, Morse and a partner named Alfred Vail worked on getting funding to finish the development of the telegraph machine and to develop the communication system that would eventually be known as Morse code. And a congressman from Maine named Francis Ormond Jonathan Smith eventually backed the pair and he helped them get a congressional grant of $30,000 to run a telegraph line from the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. That was a span of 30 Eight miles, about 61 kilometers. Their proof of concept demonstration for Congress had been a line strung between committee rooms in the Capitol that relayed several messages back and forth. Even as the line from Washington to Baltimore was being laid, they were already using it. Uh, they would they would sort of put out a stretch and then attach a machine to it and use it. And on May 1st of 1844, it had reached within 15 miles of Baltimore. And the line was, was used to transmit Whig convention nominees to Morse in uh, Washington, D.C. to announce. The word via telegraph line got to D.C. more than an hour faster than the train from Baltimore that was carrying the news. Yeah, that was kind of a big moment where people were like, this, this is viable. This is really going to happen. Uh, <laughs> and on May 24th of 1844, the first telegraph on the newly completed D.C. Baltimore line. So there had been some going on before, but the completed line, the first uh, note was sent by Morse and it read, what hath God wrought? Uh, once this message had actually been sent, it led to a period of ex- explosive growth in communications. There were also multiple challenges to his patent on it, which he was granted in 1847. But ultimately, he was recognized as the inventor of the telegraph. Yeah, just as with any big invention we've talked about, there were a lot of people who wanted to say, no, no, I was part of that development. I was an important important part of it, including Here's the gentleman. Here's my prior that he, art on this machine. Yeah, including the gentleman that he had talked with uh, while he was returning from Europe, Charles Thomas Jackson. Again, that would be a whole great episode in and of itself. But over the following decade after they finished that that line between the capital and Baltimore, more than 20,000 miles, that's 32,000 kilometers roughly, of telegraph line was laid in the U.S. And in Europe, a similar set of crisscrossing lines were being laid throughout the continent, connecting people like never before. Seriously, I, I want to make sure people grasp what a huge moment this was. It's kind of like how we went from uh, regular kind of clunky cell phones to smartphones and sort of everything changed in terms of trying to give a contemporary example. It was that big of a jump. As quickly as telegraph lines were spreading, ideas for new ways to extend and push the technology were also spreading. It wasn't long before the idea of sending telegraphs across large bodies of water took root in the minds of people who were, you know, thinking about advancements. While a so-called Siberian telegraph line was also consider, beca- considered because it would require fewer dips into the water, a transatlantic cable was deemed to be more viable because it would need to travel a shorter distance. Yeah, it also wouldn't have to deal quite so much with cold. Uh, but of course, a line across, or more accurately, under the water, posed a number of challenges. It had to be strong and resilient, and it had to be insulated. But of course, there were also industrious types who were completely ready and willing to rise to such challenges. Uh, But before we start talking about them and the Herculean efforts that were made to install this cable across the Atlantic, let's pause for a moment and have a word from one of our sponsors. In the United States, Cyrus West Field was the driving force behind the idea to run a cable under the Atlantic, and he started championing this idea in 1854. Field was a financier from Stockbridge, Massachusetts, who had made his money in the paper business, which cracks me up a little bit because, you know, that might affect his own financial interests, uh, before putting his efforts into submarine telegraph. (laughs) 
And this would not be the first line that was dropped underwater. Uh, a link between Great Britain and France was completed at the beginning of the 1850s uh, that went un- through the English Channel. But this was obviously a far more ambitious thing than any linking line that had existed up to that point. And there were other underwater lines as well, but again, much shorter. <laughs> not under the entire ocean. Yeah. Field gathered information from a variety of sources in this whole plan. He spoke extensively with Frederick Newton Gisborne, who had run a line from Nova Scotia to the tip of Newfoundland before his company collapsed. He talked to an oceanographer named Matthew Maury to try to gain insight into issues like currents and the shifting of the seafloor. And he referred to Samuel Morse to make sure that the technical requirements for this line would be adequately addressed. Morris had also run some underwater lines in the New York Harbor, so he had some insights into the actual running of submarine cables. Cyrus Field formed the New York, Newfoundland, and London Telegraph Company to manage this venture. But he didn't stay uh, independent. It didn't stay that company. Uh, That eventually rolled up under a parent company that he helped form called the Atlantic Telegraph Company. And Field at that point entered into a partnership with three British men as they established that firm. That was Charles Bright and then John and Jacob Brett, two brothers. And that happened in 1856. The Brett brothers had already run that line that connected Britain and France across the English Channel under the umbrella of the General Oceanic and Submarine Telegraph Company. So they had some pretty good experience to start with. The partnership began with 350,000 British pounds in capital. Field's own money made up about a quarter of that startup uh, capital. And then the company was able to get a charter to run an insulated line of cable across the Atlantic. The British government also paid an annual subsidy to the project of uh, 1,400 pounds per year. So first, the cable that they needed had to be manufactured, and that was a process which basically took the entire first half of 1857. It was made by two different companies, Glass Elliott and Company of Greenwich and R.S. Newell and Company of Liverpool. And this cable was made using seven 22-gauge copper wires, which were twisted together, and then they were coated with latex. And that latex-shrouded line was then wrapped in tarred hemp, and then that was coated with an iron wire casing that was made from 18 strands of wire, each made with seven charcoal annealed iron wires that were 22 gauge. So it was a lot of wrapped and coiled wire making up one big cable. The cable, once it was all assembled, was approximately three quarters of an inch in diameter. And a mile of cable required 133 miles of wire to make it. It weighed about a ton per mile of length. Yeah, that is not not light business. And in the meantime, the Atlantic Telegraph Company, while that cable was being made, had been drumming up aid from both the U.S. and British navies for this project. So the U.S. Navy had already compiled a survey of the Atlantic Ocean between Newfoundland and Ireland that identified the most suitable route for the cable to sit. And once the cable was completed in the two locations by those two companies, it was placed aboard two ships. The Niagara from the U.S. collected the cable that had been manufactured in Liverpool, and the HMS Agamemnon of Great Britain took on the cable that had been manufactured in Greenwich. The initial run set out from the most westerly point of Ireland the first week of August 1857, after the European end of the cable was brought ashore. First, the Niagara would lay down its cargo of cable, which would take it to the Mid-Atlantic, and then the cable aboard the Agamemnon would be spliced to that and would be dropped for the rest of the distance to North America. And things went pretty well for almost a week. Uh, But after six days, there was an error handling the braking mechanism that controlled the cable's speed of descent into the water. So the line snapped less than 400 miles, or about 644 kilometers, into the trip. And they tried with, like, grappling mechanisms to try to grab it again, but they just could not. So the Niagara and the Agamemnon returned to port. Additional cable had to be made up for the lengths of line that were lost to the bottom of the sea. The second attempt started with the same two vessels, but this time, instead of both setting out in the same direction, they met in the mid-Atlantic and then spliced the ends of the cables from each ship together, and then the ships set out in separate directions, like some kind of math problem. (laughs) Unsurprisingly to me, the line broke almost as soon as the two ships started moving. That just seems like the worst, worst possible plan. Well, that's eventually how it happens, so don't get too judgy. <laughs> I'm just saying, it seems, it seems like this is rife. It for... seems like a big gamble. Yeah. 
but they had done some testing in smaller bodies of water while they were having that extra cable made, and it seemed like this was probably going to work. So a third attempt was started right away, again, beginning with a join of the two lines before each of the ships set out. And with only 40 miles, about 64 kilometers of cable in place, there was yet another snap. They tried a third time, and this yielded better results. Uh, They did manage to put down 146 miles, about 235 kilometers worth of line, before there was another break. And each time, they would grapple and try to get those ends, but at some point, you had to cut your losses and say, let's go back to port and reformulate our plan. At this point, I feel like the transatlantic cable had burned down, fell over, and then sank into the swamp. (laughs) That's pretty much how it feels. I would have given up at this point. But remember, they're so deep in. (laughs) Four efforts gone bad was a setback. I'm sure plenty of other people were, like me, judging their failures, but it did not stop the project. Uh, Money was short, however, and these numerous failed attempts had already cost about 300,000 pounds. So new shares of the Atlantic Telegraph Company had to be offered for sale at 20 pounds each to try to build up the company coffers. And they did. They made some money and were ready to go. So the Agamemnon and the Niagara set sail for the rendezvous point in the mid-Atlantic once again on June 10th of 1858 after they had been restocked with cable and machinery. But this time a storm quickly derailed their plans. The Niagara managed the weather without too much trouble, but the Agamemnon really, really suffered. Uh, According to accounts, it almost capsized. It lost some of the coal that it was using for fuel as it was being tossed around at sea. And while the two vessels did manage to meet and start their cable laying mission, things quickly failed. Not only did the cable snap, but the Agamemnon had to use sail power to try to return to the rendezvous point. But the Niagara at that point had returned to Ireland, as had been in the plan in the event that the two ships lost communication. So eventually the Agamemnon also made it back to port on July 12th, and the next two weeks were spent repairing and restocking and resetting the ships. Four vessels met in the Atlantic Ocean on July 29th, 1858, to try yet again. The ships were the Agamemnon, the Valorous, the Niagara, and the Gorgon. With the Agamemnon and the Valorous aimed at Ireland, and the Niagara and the Gorgon headed toward Trinity Bay, Newfoundland, the four vessels started laying cable. And this time, they managed to connect the line, shore to shore, all the way across the Atlantic. So apparently, they just needed two more ships, additionally. (laughs) Well, they I think those may have even been on a prior attempt, but I wasn't clear on that in my research. They they're kind of left out of a lot of the talk because they were kind of just support vessels at that point. They were still doing basically the same plan with two ships running line and then they had some support in case, I presume. <laughs> but they did manage to get it stretched across. And that cable was completed on August 5th when the Agamemnon reached Ireland. That was one day after the Niagara had brought the North American end of the cable to Trinity Bay. And all told at this point, the line ran more than 2,000 miles, that's about 3,200 kilometers, across the ocean floor. And once it was connected to the local telegraph stations, it worked. On August 16, 1858, the first telegraph cable to cross the Atlantic was sent, and it read, Directors of Atlantic Telegraph Company, Great Britain, to directors in America. Europe and America are united by telegraph. Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. And then that same message was relayed back across the Atlantic to confirm that the line was working in both directions. Success! For right now, we're going to revel in this success for just a moment. And while we do, we're going to have a quick word from one of our sponsors. So after that initial success, Queen Victoria and President James Buchanan were then able to trade messages on this newly laid line. And the British monarch cabled on August 17th the following message. The Queen desires to congratulate the President upon the successful completion of this great international work in which the Queen has taken the greatest interest. The Queen is convinced that the President will join her in fervently hoping that the electric cable which now connects Great Britain with the United States will provide an additional link between the two nations whose friendship is founded upon their common interest and reciprocal esteem. The Queen has much pleasure in thus directly communicating with the President and in renewing to him her best wishes for the prosperity of the United States. 
Buchanan replied, The President cordially reciprocates the congratulations of Her Majesty the Queen on the success of this great international enterprise accomplished by the science, skill, and indomitable energy of the two countries. It is a triumph more glorious because far more useful to mankind than ever won by conqueror on the field of battle. May the Atlantic Telegraph under the blessing of heaven prove to be a bond of perpetual peace and friendship between the kindred nations and an instrument designed by divine providence to diffuse religion, civilization, liberty, and law throughout the world. In this view, we uh, will not all the nations of Christendom spontaneously unite in the declaration that it shall be forever neutral and that its communications shall be held sacred in passing to the place of their destination, even in the midst of hostilities. So you may have noticed these are wordy telegrams. They're real wordy. <laughs> They're talky talky. Uh, and apparently they were quite vexing to the telegraph operators. And because of the lengthy nature of these messages, they each took more than 17 hours to transmit. Don't talk so much, you guys. <laughs> like, I get it. You want to convey a lot of stuff. <laughs> Transmission received. Stop. Line works. Stop. Congratulations. This is awesome. <laughs> This excitement was really fleeting because the line had problems almost immediately. There are two primary reasons that were discussed for the failure. One was that the cable just was not strong enough, and the initial messages had been sent with too high a voltage that taxed the line. So in addition to being so long, they were also damaging. As for the voltage, this was largely due to the fact that operators on either side of the, the Atlantic were fiddling with the settings, trying to figure out how to optimize the signal, but neither knew what the person on the other end was doing. As for the weakness of the cable, there were some claims that one of the cable manufacturers had left a section of the cable outside in the hot sun before it was delivered to the ships, uh, and that some of the latex had melted and ruined the insulation. Yeah, so it, it could also have been a, a combination of those things. It could also have just been, this is difficult. <laughs> In my head, there's a little cartoon where like a, a a crab or a lobster just walks up and kind of gnaws on it. And I know it's made to not let that happen, but the cartoon is very cute. I was thinking a shark because I've seen Jaws. <laughs> So the first transatlantic telegraph line was unfortunately completely dead within just a few weeks. It finally went silent on September 18th of 1858. But even with that failure, some really impressive work had been done in the time that the cable was functional. Over the course of those 23 days, 271 messages had been sent from Newfoundland and 129 messages had been sent from Ireland. Undaunted with this, at this point, just unending list of setbacks cyrus westfield decided to try again i have to commend him he had to start the entire process from scratch starting all the way back at the stage of raising the money to fund the venture for a sixth try it took more than seven years to have another attempt ready but in 1865 they were ready to go and this time it was a single ship, the Great Eastern out of Britain, that was chartered to lay the line solo. The Great Eastern was larger than all of the previous vessels that had been used to lay telegraph line, and it started in Ireland and headed west toward North America. So they're still planning on this same exact positioning. And at about the 1,200 mile, that's 1931 kilometers, uh, 1931 kilometer mark, it happened again. The thing that keeps happening in all of these failed attempts, the cable snapped. So at this point, every effort was made to recover the dropped end of the line because at that point, they're already more than halfway there. But eventually, they had to abandon it for the time being and the Great Eastern returned to port. More cable had to be made before another attempt could be mounted, but finally the Great Eastern was loaded with enough cable to cross the ocean, as well as additional cable to splice the lost end if it could be found and complete a second line. Okay, brace. Because this 1866 voyage and laying of the line was shockingly smooth. It went just fine. <laughs> the end of the cable, which connected Newfoundland to Ireland, reached a fishing village named Hearts Content on the North American coast on July 27th of 1866. I, if I had been the person at, at the helm of that ship and also everyone else working on the entire thing, I would have been like, am I awake right now? <laughs> Yeah. I feel like I would have held my breath for like a month at a time as I crossed the ocean. 
So this time, the first message to be sent was, quote, a treaty of peace has been signed between Austria and Prussia. It's a whole lot shorter. Uh, Queen Victoria also sent a message to President Andrew Johnson saying the Queen congratulates the President on the successful completion of an undertaking which she hopes may serve as an additional bond of union between the United States and England. So a lot more concise than previously. Yeah, which is kind of funny because this line was a little bit better and stronger and it probably could have handled those longer messages much more effectively, but lesson learned. Uh, So this was the first permanent line across the ocean and buoyed by the success of that first line, the Great Eastern did head back to find the lost line from its earlier mission and they did manage to locate it even though it had sunk 16,000 feet, that's about 4,877 meters to the ocean floor. And that line was grappled, pulled up, and it was spliced and a backup line was also successfully completed on September 8th. Also amazing. The telegraph cable was made available to customers right away, but it was really a service for the incredibly wealthy. To send a transatlantic telegraph cost a dollar per letter, payable in gold. That would be a lot today. A dollar a letter. Uh, So in 1866, that was an incredible amount of money. Yeah, that was like mind-blowingly costly. But keep in mind that like part of what was driving all of these attempts, one, it's like the sort of humankind, like, let's all communicate with each other, global village ideal, but it was also a business venture. So part of what gave them that tenacity, I think, was that they were all in and they were like, if we ever want to make money off this thing, if we ever want to make our money back, we got to finish it. Uh, And that's going to be really expensive. (laughs) Uh, But they did go into business and did quite well. More undersea lines were laid in the two decades following that first permanent cable with an estimated 107 thousand miles, that's 172,000 kilometers, of cable along the bottoms of the world's oceans by the late 1880s. So just 20 years later, it was everywhere. And the lifespan of those first two cables was not especially long. I mean, it was a lot longer than that first successful attempt. One of them failed in 1872 and the other in 1877. So one lasted for six years and the other for 11. But by that point, this failure was no longer an issue because there was a lot of redundancy in the system by that point, thanks to other faster cables that were running along the same lines. Uh, So global communication network basically established. I mean, there were lots of other places that needed to be connected, but there was no longer an ocean that needed to be Cross. Yeah, I mean, they were they were connecting across oceans pretty much all over the place, which is pretty amazing. Um, and those lines were used for a long time. It really wasn't until, you know, into the 1900s when there were viable other options. So, very cool. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 